Chapter 3 of The Voice of the Lion Was Heard in the Land A Good Omens Fan Fiction Written by A. N. D. Read aloud by Skaya Simaru If you enjoy this podfic, you can check out the original story on Archive of Our Own. If you would like to hear more of my recordings or see some of my own work, you can find me through the pen and screen name of Skaya Simaru. The Voice of the Lion Was Heard in the Land Chapter 3 The Population of Paradise Summary As knew intellectually that the shift meant a bigger caste, emotionally, though, his heart stuttered in sudden fear when he and Tony arrived for their first table read. The people who predicted that Leo and friends wouldn't last long on the Internet were, in a way, correct. At the end of the year, just as the second set of kick-started episodes were mailed out on DVD, the cartoon was taken offline with some episodes unaired because CBeebies had bought it. What had been surprisingly popular before exploded with the power of the BBC backing it. More support staff, more money, more animators, more voice actors. As knew intellectually that the shift to the BBC meant a bigger cast, Pepper had been pressuring Adam to bring on at least one woman for some time, insisting that using Tony, who had been willing and able to voice a convincing girl, would just be perpetuating the patriarchal usurpation of women's voices. Emotionally, though, his heart stuttered in sudden fear when he and Tony arrived for their first CBeebies table read. There were so many people around that table, most of them men, probably cheaper than the raised salaries Az's and Tony's agents had negotiated. He knew his agent Sandy had asked for too much. They were going to get fired. They had already been fired. They had been replaced. The BBC wanted a fresh start. The BBC didn't want Tea Guy making everyone think of Twillikers every time Leo spoke. Tony took his hand and squeezed it comfortingly, directing him to the two empty chairs across from Adam. As sat, plastering on a nervous smile that probably wasn't fooling anyone, and laid out his probably unnecessary array of highlighters and pens, waiting. Tony dropped casually into his seat, leaning to put his arm on the back of Az's chair, warm and solid and reassuring. <clears throat> We've got a lot of new people and a lot of changes, so let me do the introductions, Adam said. He started to his left. Everyone, this is Tracy Potts. She's going to be Chandra the Cheetah and Harriet the Hedgehog. Tracy was an older woman with the Don't I Know You From Somewhere face of an actress who'd been in the background of everything and the sharp, wary air of someone who'd had to scrap hard for work after she aged out of ingenue roles. As had expected her and her casting, Pepper and Adam had made it clear that they were going to change the genders of Harry the Hedgehog, voiced by Az, and Charles the Cheetah, voiced by Tony, immediately. Next to her was an older man, introduced as Lance C. Shadwell, a grizzled actor saved from being a has-been only due to never really having been. 
And that's where the trouble began. He's going to be Zachary the Zebra, Adam said, and a roaring started in Az's ears. Uh, I'm Zach Zebra, and that's my rule. Worse, Adam was continuing. And Malcolm the Meerkat. Uh, I'm, I'm Malcolm too. Sheer politeness allowed Az to give his usurper a tight smile and nod of recognition, which was met with a short answering nod. Shadwell looked shabby shrewd, and a few other things starting with S.H., including that state of inebriation Tony called a just short of schnockered. Tony's thumb started rubbing consolingly against Az's back, not stopping even when the next actor, a young man with the improbable name Newton Pulsifer, got Tony's Everett the Elephant and Gerard the Giraffe. That's it for the main cast, Adam said. For our guest stars we have... But as let those names and characters roll over him as he marginally relaxed. He was still Leo. Tony was still Simon. As long as they had those roles and each other, everything was going to be just fine. Finally, the introductions wound to them. That's Tony Crowley behind the shades, Adam said. Hi, everyone, Tony said with an offhand wave. He's Horace the Hornbill, but more importantly, he's our co-lead, Simon the Snake. Tony sat up straight, his eyebrows raising above his sunglasses. Simon had originally been written as a supporting character. As patted his thigh in congratulations, wriggling a bit in anticipation. And last but never least, Azira Fell, Harold the Hippo, and also our main character, Leo the Lion. Hearing it quieted the last quiver of anxiety, As smiled benevolently at the members of his cartoon kingdom. From almost the minute Az stopped worrying, Tony started. Oh, Newton was fine, barely out of acting school. Shy, quiet, and a bit of a walking disaster. If anyone was going to trigger squealing microphone feedback or accidentally trip over a cord and unplug important machinery, it was going to be Newt. But he was a competent voice actor, and every now and then he'd say something that proved he was incredibly intelligent, which made him interesting enough to be around. Tracy, on the other hand, was a threat. Tracy had been delicately flirting with Az within the hour. That wasn't great, but it didn't bother Tony much. Az loved Tony too much to stray. Oh, who was he kidding? He was worried. Tracy might be middle-aged, but she was pretty, dressed to show it, loved food, and had a body sense of humor. Just like his beautiful, bisexual Az. Az, who had started out treating her with the same formal politeness that Tony remembered from their own first days together, only to rapidly reach the point where they were openly swapping recipes and dirty jokes. And Tony started counting the seconds until the end of the day when he'd have Az safely back to himself. Then there came the fateful table read. Tracy and Az had their heads down over by the tea table, giggling over something completely filthy based on their gestures. When Shadwell, like Winsleydale, he preferred his last name, looked up from his ever-present pile of tabloids and grunted, <laughs> Can't you see he's a ponzi woman? Everyone froze. 
There was a faint, horrified, Uncle, you can't say things like that, from Newton. But no one, least of all Shadwell, minded him. Putting yourself on display like a painted strumpet. He'll no pay you that kind of attention, Shadwell continued. Tony snarled. <coughs> Newton whimpered. <coughs> As stared, mouth agape in shock. <gasps> Tracy raised an eyebrow. Then she very deliberately smoothed down the front of her bright blouse, which coincidentally tugged it just enough to show a fraction more cleavage, before snapping at Shadwell. That's no way to behave to your co-workers. She patted As on the forearm. Don't mind him. He's just jealous. I'm not. Don't think I haven't seen you looking. She said briskly, overriding Shadwell's spluttering objection. Not a chance unless you behave and you apologize. As had pulled himself together with the soft, sunny, wicked smile that Tony knew meant trouble. He simply said, <laughs> Well, to be fair, I am, aren't I, Tony? <coughs> He didn't even get a chance to finish whatever noise he was going to make before As gently, firmly, inexorably cradled his head and dragged him over for a kiss. A very passionate kiss with a lot of tongue. Uh, I'm not sure I'm old enough to be watching this. Newton said bemusedly from a thousand miles away. Shadwell wasn't saying anything as they broke for air. It was his turn to watch, mouth agape. Tracy walked around the table and cupped Shadwell's chin, scarlet nails not quite clawing as she dragged his face around to hers in a jingle of bracelets. There'll be no more nonsense from you, or you won't be allowed to take me to dinner on Friday and get a kiss like that of your own. I did not want. Seven o'clock, sharp. But it's settled then. She jingled back to her seat, patted Az's hand, and picked up her script again. Az and Tony had argued about her chances, but on Friday, Shadwell arrived dressed in a semi-decent suit that seemed to make him slightly uncomfortable and even pulled out Tracy's chair at the table. She smiled with regal satisfaction. Tony handed As a fiver under the table. With the pecking order sorted out and various anxieties laid to rest, the voice talent of Adam's animals settled down to the process of evolving from polite co-workers to friendly co-workers to friends. It was a happy set which made for happy work and even more happy guest stars, of which there were plenty. Shadwell rustled his newspaper. In between takes, he never spoiled recordings. Hmm. It says here David Tennant's coming to voice one of our animals. Oh, we're never getting David Tennant, Tracy said. He's too famous for the likes of us. He's got four young children, Newt replied. He mentioned in his podcast that he wanted to have something to share with his littlest ones. He was interviewing Judy Dench at the time, and she sounded interested said she wanted something to do for her grandchildren, and she heard we were good. Well, we are, As said, stoutly loyal to the show he now considered his. But Adam and Pippa have been making such a point of hiring unknowns to help them get started. I've always liked that part. <laughs> You've liked pretending to be their dad or something. I've never seen anyone so anxious to give helpful advice. Tony drawled over his coffee mug. 
as if you don't. As laughed at him. <laughs> I like him younger. True, his favorite part of being Simon is talking to the little kids. As told the others fondly. They nodded. Over half the fan mail coming in to Adam's animals was addressed to Mr. Simon or Mr. Snake. Much of it was from viewing children with a weak grasp on the difference between cartoon and reality, but the majority of it was children thanking him for visiting. There wasn't a children's hospital ward in the greater London area Tony hadn't gone to with a stuffed snake slung around his shoulders that he pretended was whispering in his ear telling him to pass on messages of cheer and ridiculously bad advice. Simon's perfect plan goes wrong was still the most popular plotline. So it was that between up-and-coming young actors cycling through Adam's Animals production on their way to fame, and older, well-known ones wanting to be part of the show they let their children and grandchildren watch. Leo's many, many friends came to include a huge percentage of the acting community. And they were friends, with the possible exception of Shadwell, who preferred his newspapers and conspiracy theories. The main cast of Leo threw its metaphorical arms wide and embraced everyone who came along, as if they were a long-lost, much-missed relative. The enthusiasm was returned, as Tony, Newt, and Tracy found Let's Work Together Again job offers falling into their laps, a cameo here, a theatrical role there, television appearances everywhere. As the show was sold in more markets, their circle of friends and opportunities expanded around the globe. When CBeebies Leo turned ten, the whole world threw an anniversary party. There had been video interviews and press junkets, but the main celebration was the big convention in London the one where voice actors for Simon's and Leo's from every country gathered. Backstage, a handful of harried interpreters and gophers were attempting to wrangle their various pairings for the big reveal. Uh, ¿Dónde está el español Simon? Russia. Where are the Russian? Ah, it's possible. Uh, Japan. Nihon. As listened to the chaos bubbling behind him, peeking through the curtains and smiling. Tony was out there, bouncing fussy babies until they laughed, babbling nonsense at toddlers, hugging everyone who hugged him, and occasionally flirtatiously kissing a flustered, blushing mother on the cheek. An assistant touched his shoulder. Mr. Fell, sir? Oh, my dear, no need to serve me. How can I help you? Do you know where Mr. Crowley is? As poked a thumb at the curtain. There's a whole hall full of babies and toddlers to make faces at, and nothing was going to stand in his way. The assistant turned green. Uh, as patted her on the shoulder. Go ahead and start the show, my dear. He knows how to make an entrance. He went back to peering through the curtain. <laughs> it makes you happy to see him happy, said the Italian Leo, coming up next to him. <laughs> yes, it does, very much. Out on the floor, Tony rubbed noses with a baby, making it squeal with delight. As sighed in equal delight. <laughs> I love him so. Italian Leo laughed. <laughs> I love my Simon Snake too, but uh, not like that. Eh? He is my little brother. As chuckled. 
<laughs> Simon is a good character for a little brother to play. Always up to mischief, always doing something. <laughs> something the older brother must always clean up, like Leo. That's what I like about the character, as mused. Leo and Simon are so very relatable. <laughs> and in my case, related. Italian Leo paused. I have been a voice actor for a very long time. I just wanted you to know, Leo to Leo, this is the job I am proudest of. Me too, my friend. The intro music started to play. Out on the convention floor, Tony heard the music start and made a strangled noise, starting to push through the crowd like a salmon rushing to swim upstream. He and Az, the first Leo and Simon, would be the last introduced. Even so, the MC had to announce him twice before he reached the stairs to the stage and finally took his place in the center of the line. <coughs> well, that, Tony drawled into the microphone, trying to pat his hair back into place, was not what I planned. The audience screamed in delighted unison. As didn't bother for his introduction, coming out during the audience reaction. He shook his head in mock display, plucking Tony's shirt straight, and clearly announced into the microphone, <laughs> My dear boy, you've been very foolish again. The sound the audience made for that wasn't even a noise, more of a glorious jubilant, joyful pressure on the eardrums. You might think that we had reached the happily ever after portion of the story. As and Tony are successful, famous, comfortably well off, and very much in love. It's a perfect happy ending except for the fact that the story does not end here. Eleven years had brought Leo and friends to the top. It took less than eleven weeks to ruin everything. To be continued in Chapter 4 <clears throat> Thank you for reading. Please drop by the archive and let the author know what you thought of their work.